So, um, just to start off with, especially for the people in all the talks, will not assume a lot of data science knowledge. In fact, it assumes no data science knowledge. I know I see a bunch of you that I actually recognize. So, you actually have a real data science knowledge. We're going to add to that. But the language of vocabulary should be easy to understand. So, if you're pretending to be a person who's more online, like I don't know what data science is yet, this is a great place to learn how to try to understand that. And that's really what we're trying to do. Anything that you start with. Slides. So, what I'm going to start to do is to do what data science is. And then talk about, like, how does that compare to these terms AI and machine learning? Because the next two talks are really focused on AI. But what does that mean to you? How does that mean to data science? And then in the afternoon, the talks are really focused more on data science. Because, like, this is really to help you understand how these terms fit in and give you a broader overview. So, I'm going to start with data science. And we give a little bit of a discussion about what data science is. This is my 687 introduction to the data science class. And you, we will skip that with you because there's an exam in a little bit. So, I think that's not so bad. So, the goal of data science isn't to do data science. The goal of data science is to generate this actionable insight. It's to take data, you can come on in, we don't find it. That's the front row seats, which everybody just loves that we reserve for the people that can come later. Um, so, the goal is to generate actionable insight. It's to use data. And have it be in a way that the organization can leverage that insight proactively in the future. It is different than just getting data or having information. You have information, it's useful, but you have to have a few how to synthesize things. You have knowledge, you can do like trends, like sales are going up over time. It doesn't really tell you what to do. It's the actionable insight, and we'll talk about different examples of what actionable insight is. That's really the goal of what we're trying to achieve. Using data to data science. And here you can think of data science as being a combination of three different disciplines. So we go to some computer science. We're in high school, we don't do a lot of hardcore computer science, but they're definitely just programming. You're going to need some domain knowledge. We're going to need to talk to people that don't know. If you don't talk to people with domain knowledge, you might build a system, build some insight that is. Only irrelevant to the actual problem that we solve. And then finally, we don't need to do some math and statistics. Um, Given that, we're not going to hide it. If you need to understand what probability is, for example, you need to understand the model is 80% accurate, what does that mean? So I thought I would go over some examples in the real world just to kind of give some context to what it is. So the first one, I thought I would do this over one, maybe I won't talk about this every day anymore. So the algorithm and analytics of the there's lots of different, um, fortunately, other outbreaks as well. And there's a whole world of data science trying to understand um, how that will spread. So, how pages can to spread. People have been this before COVID, obviously, you've heard about it during COVID. People are still studying it now. And the goal here isn't just to say, again, this many people have voted. That's, that might be helpful for some people, but it's what the projection is. How many people will get this disease? Next month. And that's actually much more useful because then you can do things in terms of accounting for a hospital bed or whatever you can. And again, this is a support, but it kind of gives you a feel for trying to have something useful as opposed to just be there. So, how do I this? How do I this is focused on um, understanding, for example, where we're going. And again, to make it actionable, it's not just, well, this late October day is crazy more research use compared to what it should be, which is true. But that's not really actionable. Actionable has to be the way we're taking it over time. And what does this mean to the environment going forward? What does this mean for the therapy going forward? What does it mean for that that we can have the level of water level on the ocean and things like that? So we probably take it from just data, which is it's warm, very warm, this is the third October, to what does this mean going forward and turning that into actionable is. Another one is focused on public administration data. So the data that's, that's taking it out of from a revenue perspective, we're going to have a whole conversation about it this afternoon. So what is open data? What is data that we have created? Be a revenue with, with the people, and how might that be useful? So I won't talk about that a lot because you're going to have a whole session on that later. Health data works. So there's lots of data about health. So there's data, for example, about drug use, and which 
drugs are useful and which drugs are not useful. There's data about different treatments for different diseases. There's data about symptoms and what disease you might have. And again, it's not about having any particular um, diagnosis. It's about having all of this data and being able to have insightful information to make a prediction. So that prediction might be I can really do all the detect if you have skin cancer or not. That's actually more insight. As opposed to just general information. Another one is sports analytics. So you may be going to do a talk later at 3 or 2 3 o'clock uh, for baseball now. So analytics is used throughout all of sports. It's used pretty much across all different fields. So in sports, it changes the play of somebody should run or how you evaluate people. But that's actually used not just in sports. If you think about how to evaluate people, so we'll deal with HR analytics, for example. So you can think about data science being used in kind of any field in a similar manner. And business analytics is probably the most broadly used, broad area of uh, focus. So this can be anything from predicting sales, understanding what characteristics will generate better sales, understanding what aspects of your product, if you're at the hotel, what, what makes people like the hotel better or not. So having actual insight is definitely useful in this context. You've all seen it in business. So I'm showing sure you have got here, but I think you're showing sure you in your favorite streaming video. And all of these platforms, including things like TikTok, suggest what to do next. Right? And the goal is to keep you engaged. Now, engage means different things in different platforms. So engage in Amazon is buy something. Engage in Netflix is watch something. Engage in TikTok is also actually watch something. It's just a different way of how you watch it. And then you have data science to provide actionable insight. Now, you can take a step back and say, is that actual insight useful for you, the consumer, or useful for the business? I'm on TikTok or Netflix. And the people are going to be so they want to be your age in the platform. So they're going to give you things that are interesting. And to some extent, you prefer to be suggesting things that are interesting. Like if it's going to give you bad suggestions, and you're not going to use the platform at all, and you won't like it. Now there's a more to find out if you're providing you something that's interesting, providing you something that's predictive. And so we'll talk a little bit later. But I think you got the challenge is uh, predictive models. And when they're useful and when it says they're being used in your own product. In this case, that's kind of an example of that. So we'll talk about that a little bit. But at a high level, this is actionable insight. And if it's not abused, it's helpful. Like, I appreciate if I watch something on Netflix, it would suggest something that's helpful as opposed to me trying to figure out what I might actually find. Like, right? so it actually can be useful for me to think. Finally, in analytics across everything, I like that, so I kind of love the analytics. I thought it doesn't. Work well with our analytics, but some of dogs probably would. So, in almost every aspect of where you can collect data, or where things happen and something could be used to collect data, you can really try to figure out what actionable insight can generate. <coughs> That's across the whole life cycle from starting with what is the business problem, what is the way we trying to achieve, so all the way through the end, like how we actually is this actionable insight. So that, in a nutshell, is what data science is. So as I mentioned, my goal here in a very short amount of time is to give you a high level understanding of data science, but also like machine learning and AI. Because so those are all terms that people use some of them interchangeably, but they're not fully interchangeable. Um, so you can see that there's a little bit of The first thing I'll point out is you can see that there's a lot of overlap between the two. And that that is the heart of what people think of, and that's why they're using interchangeably sometimes. There is a lot of overlap, but I'll kind of also try to explain what some of the differences are. So one of the key differences is the data science you can see I look up there is the end-to-end -end process of kind of collecting data and generating actionable insights. Machine learning really connects data science to AI, you can think of it that way. And that focuses on building this predictive model. So when you're building this predictive model, you have the data and you're trying to really focus on how to how you can build an algorithm or use existing algorithms to generate this prediction. So it's like a key part of data science, but the part about other things that need knowledge is not about machine learning, but data science. So that's one way to think about the difference. And then there's AI, which obviously AI is going to be used even more recently, and I'll talk about that. 
But AI definitely uses machine learning, but it can use it in other contexts. So a robot that walks is definitely considered part of AI. It's machine learning because the way that robot learns to walk is machine learning. It's, it's springing up that if it doesn't lift up a leg, it's going to fall down. But it's not really part of the science because it's not really an end to end data to provide actionable insight. It's a little bit different. So, classically, people would think of like a robot that walks or a self driving car as being very much AI, very much machine learning, and kind of data science, but not as much here. I kind of want to explain a couple of other ways, but here you can kind of see like the third thing we have here. So, using the grant boundaries. Way to get actionable inside of the compact kind of relevant information. I think about machine learning, it's very easy algorithms to do that. And here is to simulate human actions, human intelligence. So if I want actionable insight about Netflix, I don't really think about that as human intelligence. I think about that as a predictive model to data human maybe, but it's not really about human intelligence. So those are several differences. Another way to think about it. Is you can think about machine learning as being purely a subset of AI. You get data science as part of that. But I thought I would talk about an area of machine learning. So, one area of machine learning is called deep learning. So, deep learning has only been around, well, it's been a decade for, for a long time, but it's only been used, that's probably a better way to say it. It's only been used for about five years. And it's had a huge impact. So, what I show on this chart here is this is speech recognition. So Alexa, Google, you know, okay, Google, if your favorite um, device. But how do those systems work? And it took a long time to get good. So for many, many years, you can see down here, you know, like the machine could get like 75% of the conversation, which is pretty good, but not actually good enough. Humans get about 95%. So what that means is, as I'm talking here, like, I'm probably bubbling 5% of the time, but you're not getting anything I'm saying, but you're getting most of what I'm saying. And up until deep learning happened, the machine learning gave me this thing to me, it got like 75%, basically using a quarter of what I would say. That's not very useful, is the truth. Then deep learning was introduced, and the field of speech recognition totally changed, where over two or three years, it equal tunes. So machines using deep learning techniques got like 95%. And from 2018 to like 2020, it actually got better. Now, it's just, even back in 2020, it was about 97%. So machines can understand now my conversation better than any of you. So that's deep learning. And I'll talk a little bit about it here, but it's a type of machine learning. It's even more that works kind of in some sense trying to simulate how your brain works. And basically learn and learn things that you can learn about with speech recognition. So deep learning is really useful. Deep learning is also really useful in self-driving cars. So here's some examples of where deep learning is used in addition. I mentioned skin cancer detection, so that's also deep learning. So there's many really different use cases for a specialized machine learning algorithm called deep learning. So if you're deep learning, it's just a machine learning algorithm. There's many other machine learning algorithms. It's a specialized one. It's one that's specifically using what's kind of known as neural nets, which is how your brain works as well, neural networks. So I want to talk about one other area because that's probably doing the most work than any of the others. So how many people here have heard of Gen AI? You, you were like, yeah, I don't really raise my hand right um, or chat GPT. Many people are going to chat GPT. Actually, more. So, um, so, you've all heard of chat GPT. But some of you haven't heard of Gen AI. So, chat GPT is an implementation of generative AI. There are other implementations as well. It's the one that people have, as demonstrated by raising their hand, people have used the most, people know the most. But the way it works is through generative AI. So the algorithm that ChatGPT uses is the Gen AI algorithm. Gen AI algorithm is a deep learning algorithm. The deep learning algorithm is part of machine learning. So when you're using ChatGPT, you can think of it as 
Artificial intelligence, but it's still in the conversation, so it's like a, a person, if you will. It's definitely using machine learning because that's how it knows to answer you. And it's not using a general machine learning technique, it's using a deep learning technique and it's facilitated to even generate the idea. Here we have used across many different areas. So, text generation, that's chat GPT. Image generation, we can actually use Dolly. I don't care how many people are actually using Dolly. So, maybe 10%. I'll give you an example of that. It can actually be used for video generation. It can be used for tasks. So, it can be used in many different ways. I'm going to go into depth about what it is. More time to do that. But, in general, I just want you to at least get an understanding of Part of AI is part of machine learning, but part of data science, and it's also part of AI. So we can be talking about data AI, we can be talking about it in the data science context, we can talk about it in the AI context. You know, it's very similar. So we have this chat GPT. So the, the model it uses, we call it a large language model. The models are very large. These machine learning algorithms, these neural networks, if you want to think of it that way. They're enormously large. They're so large that only companies with vast amounts of computer power create them. So we can create, you know, on your laptop or in a small machine, you can create a small large language model. But you can create a smaller model like that. And it kind of works okay. But if you want it to look as big as ChatGPT does, you need lots and lots of computer power. Like lots of it. And so, the only companies that can afford that are companies that get hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in the market. So that's why Google has it, Microsoft, really large companies can afford to invest lots of money to build these machine learning models. But if you say you build these machine learning models, there are no machine learning models that I talk about. And all of this is part of generative AI. It's simple as generative AI, because the way the models work, like in the language conversation part, I don't say it's silly, but all it does is it predicts what the next word should be in the conversation. So based on the entire internet, it has all this data. It's just text data, a lot of the internet data is text data. And so based on that, it kind of knows that oftentimes, um, you know, A, A follows B, follows word C, and it kind of knows that this paragraph was often after before and after that paragraph. So it's also all about part of it about what we follow, what we what concept follows next concept. And so when you ask Chat GPT a question, they must understand what you ask in the way that we human think we understand. What it does is it knows that question, it knows that set of text, and it knows based on how to do what others have answered in that context. So it's not understanding the question per se. But it knows your question enough to know how to visualize what the answer should be. So some people think of that as understanding the question because it can generate insights that are unique. Some people don't. But it certainly doesn't understand it like we think we understand the conversation. So here's an example. So this says, some people like this picture, some people don't. This means it generated with generative AI. So this one actually, I don't think it was Dolly, it could have been, I think it was a different program. But Dolly is one you can get through ChatGPT, the same company. There's several others. And what, what you do is you describe the picture you want to create, and it creates this. You can create that other pictures as well. And then the question is, is this art that the person created with the instructions, or is it art that the Dolly or whatever the other large language model is created. Right? Those are actually owned by the all the different pictures on the internet that were used as input data to create this picture. But kind of like who owns something that was created is not an easy question to answer that. It's not an easy question from like a law perspective. Even just from like a conceptual question. How do you think about this? So over the next few years, people will kind of debate this a lot. We go back to this picture, this one, this picture, this picture, actually, of the, the artist, if you will, won an award in the question that's, is that okay? Was it a competition? Was it an art competition? One. But you 
the question is conceptually the vocation of a computer augmented system is equal to the continuous version of the question. How many people have faced deep space before? Almost everywhere, that's good. The problem is, it's hard to figure out which ones are real and which ones are not. So, if this is five creators, you might not know about these, you know, things after this and lots of movies. Um, if you have to know about these videos, most of these are not real. And if you watch them, these are, I think, TikTok mostly. If you watch them, you wouldn't know which ones are real and which ones are not. So, the problem with that, I give you any more The great part is, it's a great way to kind of have some fun, do some interesting things, have people maybe do things with you. But the problem is, like, maybe Tom Cruise doesn't want to say some of the things that he thinks are having him say. More importantly, maybe you don't know which ones are real and which ones aren't. Just because Tom Cruise in the video says he's the real Tom Cruise, that doesn't mean he's the real Tom Cruise. Like, you know, and you can do that. Like, you just Google like deep fake Tom Cruise. You'll find a whole bunch of them. Um, and then you can find them wrong by actually looking at movies, for example, which are true. You know, and you can say, like, it's pretty realistic. So you can do it for Tom Cruise, you can do it for politicians, you can do it for sports figures. So you put words in your mouth of your political opponent. That's a problem. Find to disagree with somebody says, but it's not fine to disagree with somebody that they didn't even say it. But if you know how to distinguish it, it's important to understand what they are. So that's a little hint about why it's hard. But I've talked a little bit about the difference between them, but I want to talk about like, why is it hard or why is the word interesting? Like, why is it interesting to be in this field? And I'll give you one simple little example. So here's a statement. I saw a man on the end of a telescope. Pretty simple statement. It's two, four, six, eight, I think nine or ten words. So what do you mean this? I saw a man on the end of a hill, and I was using a telescope. You can see which one I do. That's pretty simple. That's actually what it means this. I saw a man, so that's actually the same thing. No, 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 no. And he was using something. The initial phrase could be either of those. Not clear which one is next. You have to know about the context around it. That's how JRI works. It needs to know the context around it to figure it out. You can't just look at that sentence and know what's next. It's really like because of either of these two that are just kind of a And I did the kind of five these two things together, so I filled value. Which is the chat GPT right thing for images. You can, you can use it. And I think that is that exact statement. I was like, well, which one is going to interpret? And you can see it kind of this one here. It's just it's a nice thing about a hill in the telescope. This one, I don't know, I think he's like looking in the telescope. So he got that real confused, but it kind of got a bunch of pretty good. Like, this is a young man on the hill. So, it shows one similarity of the others, probably because in the English language across the entire web of the internet, that's the context that makes the most sense. It's used more often. So, some other things to kind of be thoughtful about as we use these techniques and technologies and approaches. Lots of examples of big companies doing things that they didn't have done. And what I want to point out about these articles, not the specific articles themselves, or about Google or Amazon, they find a lot of other companies as well. I just want to point out that I guarantee you Google did not want that headline. I guarantee you Amazon did not want that headline. It's not that they say it could be a scientific study, actually, I'm going to show this. That's not what happened. Data scientists did things, and they didn't understand some of the nuance about how bias maybe was introduced into the algorithm. And if you really talk about generative AI, we're learning machine learning. They're all built on data. And what I didn't say, what I should have said, is that data, if it's biased in any way, then the model that you create will be biased. And so understanding when things have challenges 
that creates the trouble of the world, and then you go to get rid of the school bag, and maybe it's a legal, whatever the case might be. This is a lot of thought about how to think about understanding does my data have bias. In addition to bias, there's other things that you can think about is, is it fair? This is the right thing. So I'm just going to focus on this middle one here. This is Home Depot. You know, Home Depot is a store sort that of sells like stuff for like building. Home Depot. And they price things differently based on what you do. So we work right now, it's 10% more than if we were in Ohio. Not because transportation is more or less expensive, it's just they think people in New York will pay more. Is that fair? It's a good question. I want you to kind of think about that. And if you think about it, there's fairness in a couple of different dimensions. And, and you just be fair for like pricing this thing, which I'll give you a fair for giving a loan, but it's kind of like helps you understand different definitions of what you fair. So we can make loans, and we can say, for example, that we're going to be fair to two different groups, people in Ohio and people in New York, as an example, that we're going to give loans to those groups at the same rate to both states. That's fair. Right? We're going to give 67%. You can say you have 67% for people in Ohio, 67% for people in New York. So it's something that that's fair. Another definition is I'm going to be fair, and I'm just going to say if there is an 80% chance the person's going to be paid more than they did in the world. So that's fair, because everybody gets above that threshold when they're alone for not being biased. If it so happens that if you're in Ohio, you pay your loans up better, you have to work with me to pay your loans. Well, that's okay, but we're just going to use that information and we're going to be fair because we're going to just use the expected repayment. Like this one. The third one is, well, I don't know, just because I'm from Ohio, it should give you a better advantage or a worse advantage. So we're going to go on payback expected rates, but we're going to be able to just ignore the fact of where you're from. And obviously, that's where you're from Ohio versus New York. Could be other attributes. That might be more. Um, typically used to introduce bias. So we get three definitions of fair. They're all fair. Just in some contexts, some are more appropriate than others, and they're more useful than others. So you kind of need to think through like what scenario it is. It's not just a question of one of these is the right box and just Stop there. Stop there. Any questions? Yes. Uh, back to your hierarchy chart. Yes. So between machine learning and uh, deep learning, isn't deep learning really a subset of neural networks? The question was so deep learning and machine learning and what is neural networks today? So we're going to come on from the front here. So yes. So I would say it's very much. Um, all of it's machine learning, and then neural networks is a class of machine learning techniques, and then within that, deep learning is a class of neural network techniques, and general AI is a class of deep learning. So they are nested if you want to think about it, higher, which I've already done. But they definitely are related and uh, subset of each other. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, we have a question. Online, uh, person wrote, uh, given the extreme probability of a deep base, as uh, Gen AI is improving rapidly, is there any work on non reputation techniques uh, so the real people can be verified with authentic when seen or heard? Yeah, so that's a good question about everybody. But I think that's a question about deep fakes and the potential issues. And, and it's not just video, right? So you can use touch to be free. All kinds of things that might or might not be true that I might, that might not have said. Um, so we definitely a lot of work to try to understand how to use AI to better develop AI. In fact, one of the talks, I think the, the, the third talk this morning, is basically using bots for kind of to check on bots. And so I don't want to say it's like an easy thing to do, but it's definitely an active research area. Yeah. Okay. So, 
I'm just wondering about the Venn diagram that we have um, three circles, the SIA, the DI, and the GNAM. Yeah. One of the slides. And I'm just wondering if we have an overlap between all three, what is that part that is that is not AI or machine learning data science? Because if you actually look at the definition of data science as a phenomenon, oh, that is, what is that? I think it's a good So, that part is what people who typically think of as kind of the hour part of the data science life cycle. So, things like understanding the business context. If you're just doing a machine learning algorithm, you're building a cross variable domain. You're not really focused on any particular domain context. But when you're doing something in data science, you can understand a specific domain context. You can show what data might be available, and you might use like multiple different machine learning algorithms. So all of that stuff becomes part of the data science project is often here. Then you use a machine learning model or a multiple machine learning model to make some predictions. And then once you have the machine learning model to make your predictions, you have to put that into a way that non-technical people will understand. And you have to actually validate like how accurate it is. It's not just like it worked for another work. It's like a level of accuracy. Is it useful? So all that work around looking at how accurate the model is in the context of how it's being used. And how do you explain that to kind of like the users of the model? But how do you actually just implement that in some real scenario? All of that stuff is typically thought of as the data science where the machine learning that actually got created with the data model. But all this stuff around it oftentimes is thought of as data science. Uh, we also face the opposite problem that, for instance, something that was human created can be uh, said that it was uh, AI generated. Yes, so that's a good question. Uh, could have a good problem, which is I spent all this time on the project. I spent all this time creating this great essay. And then my boss or my professor said, You need to do that, do you need to that? But I really did it. And so we have the other issue, the second issue, I think it's kind of two sides of the coin, which is how do you distinguish what a computer generated versus what a human generated? And where is it important to understand that distinction, and where is it not so important? Like, when I heard a document today, and nobody asks me if I use spell checker or not, right? Because, like, yeah, yeah you probably would do that, I don't really care, it's just like a tool or anything else. I don't care if I use a spreadsheet to do some equation. And at some point, we're going to start to understand what is acceptable to use these tools for. I mean, really, it's not acceptable, but we know like, that's good. It's very loose, so we don't really understand that yet. So it's probably an issue on both sides. It's definitely an issue where people are being, like, targeted as you didn't actually create that, but in fact they did. So you don't have that issue. So follow on question. So those of us that are here in the middle, what what is our recourse today? Just dispose of everything or what 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 approach we use? I just had an article that uh, somebody sent to me and they said we we need to cut this down to a thousand words because that's all they said. But it ran through chat 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 GPT and said, please create a thousand word article out of this. And uh probably just gonna do it, yeah. Yeah, so if we're going to do that, um, you know, in, in Zoom or whatever, so, you know, somebody had a challenge of a long article that needed to condense down to a thousand words. It's hard to do that, but you know what? Chat GPT is going to be really good at that. And the question is, is that acceptable? And it depends. I think in many cases, that's totally acceptable because it's taking your work and giving you back your work just inside It's not like it's coming out of nowhere. So I think in many situations, that's totally fine. Obviously, you need to Read it because the only thing that these generative AI models often do is create things. And they don't tell you they're creating things. They kind of just pretend it's back. So if you're giving it, oftentimes it's going to give you the right result back. But if I don't want you to do the right result, if you don't have an example, I'll create an example. That example doesn't exist. You got back with the other two and asked for references to for like digital papers that they wrote. Like, I never wrote that paper. How did you think I wrote that? Well, I think it's funny you wrote this paper. 
Thank you very much. 